Hi everyone, it's Robin Holman from NeuroChat Cat, and today I'd like to talk about how our body determines where it is in space, um, at least from the inner ear. The other two ways it does is through our eyes and through our muscles, but today is all about the inner ear. Uh, in particular, let's talk about the vestibular bony labyrinth. Now, I'm hoping you're watching this movie or this movie or this clip because you already have somewhat of a review of what the inner ear structure is. This is more about the physiology of how the body takes in input and produces afferent neural information to the central nervous system. And so just a quick review. We do have our three semicircular canals. We have the posterior, the anterior, and the horizontal. Now these canals are filled with a fluid. It's called endolymph. And that fluid is free to move within that canal. And so when we move our head, for example, I turn side to side, or I move up and down. In fact, I have a visual here with that with it. Aha. So when we move, uh, when we move about side to side, uh, the fluid inside the endolymph has the freedom um, to not move along with that canal um, because it's separate and it's influenced by gravity. And so here's a semicircular canal. Let's say it's my anterior. So my anterior is about 45 degrees off to the, off to the plane. And we're going to look at this little piece of tape there, and that's going to be the cupola. All right. And so what happens is, is if I want to stimulate that anterior canal, I've gone bend forward. And come back and what you can see is see how that fluid moves freely in relation to that semicircular canal you can see that here the fluid's moving away from that piece of tape and here it's kind of moving towards it right and so using gravity and frictional forces because of the viscosity of the fluid now this is really fluid like the viscosity um, and the, the dynamics of the endolymph is a little different than this creates a drag inside that canal. And that drag inside the canal has an influence on a very important structure in the ampulla of the canal. So the ampulla, there's one on each canal, and it's kind of a bulging region on the end of the canal. And inside that ampulla is a little cupola, which is a membrane that crosses the diameter of the canal. And as that endolymph moves, Whichever direction is going to move in relation to the head creates a negative pressure from the drag of the fluid, which will either deflect or reflect the cupola. Now, what's interesting about that is at the very end of that cupola, we have the crista, which are teeny tiny little hair cells that sit on the end. I'm not drawing the most anatomically accurate position of these hair cells, but for visual purposes. And depending on whether that cupola is either deflected or reflected, it can either excite these nerve cells because as it bends up, it pulls on the hair cells and they say, hey, I'm excited. Or it can inhibit where maybe it pushes away from it, bends the hair cell in the opposite direction and says, eh, I was interested. Needless to say, that impulse is what goes down into the afferent eighth cranial nerve. And so the semicircular canals are really interesting because they actually sit on the X, Y, and Z axis. And so depending on how you move your head, any combination of movement creates a very 3D image of where you are in space. And what's kind of neat about it too is that we know that the anterior and the posterior canals are 45 degree off the, off the midline. So if I have I'm midline here and I'll come in front of the camera. And my anterior semicircular canal is 45 degrees here. My posterior semicircular canal is 45 degrees here. They're running on the same plane. So if I tilt my head, my posterior semicircular canal is stimulated and my anterior semicircular canal is inhibited. And it creates this beautiful push-pull relationship so that there is redundancy in the system. 
And we're going to talk about later how important it is to have redundancy in the system, especially when we have a hypofunctioning vestibular, uh, vestibular organ, because we're going to use that redundancy to help to rehabilitate patients to regain their sensory ability to determine where they are in space. All right, so going into uh, linear velocity, we're going to go talk about the otolith organ. So we have the utricle and the saccule. The utricle runs on the horizontal and the saccule and the vertical. Yeah. And so I'm going to need a little bit of space here to draw this. So goodbye, cochlea. I'll try to keep use of my circular canals. All right, not the Sharpie. And we're going to go red. So if you were to take a close look at, oh, I lost my utero and my saccule. If you were to take a close look at the utero and saccule, I'm going to enlarge it. Kind of this large, jelly-like kind of matrix. And it sits on top of the macula. And it has these little teeny tiny hair cells, similar to the hair cells that were sitting at the end of the cupola that were sensitive to when the cupola got pulled up or pulled down to create excitation or inhibition. On top of this utricle sits these calcium carbonate crystals called the otoconia on top of the otolith. And they chill out like so. And I started to make a triangle, whatever. Needless to say, these calcium carbonate car crystals have a larger density and they're weighted. And so if we think about movement, if I'm going to move quickly this way. You can almost imagine that these weighted stones, these otoconia, are going to be kind of left behind as everything else moves forward. So you can see that this jelly-like matrix, because of the weighted system we have here, is going to deflect these hair cells backwards. And the more you deflect it back, the more excited that nerve gets. Now interestingly, the longer it sits in that deflection, so let's say we speed up to go 60 miles per hour, really deflected hair cell. The longer you stay there, the less excited the cell is. The brain says, well I haven't moved in a while, it must not be very important. So it actually will habituate that response. But as soon as you slow down and the hair cell changes positions again, suddenly it gets excited and will start providing more input. And so why is that important? Well, if we didn't have that habituation process and say we're driving a car, we would constantly be feeling the experience of acceleration. So having a habituation process allows us to move at faster speeds for a prolonged period of time with the brain not having to spend so much energy focusing on, yes, you're moving forward. It just recognizes it and really only is sensitive to when that changes. Now the saccule is in a similar, uh, works in a similar uh, mechanism, except for the matrix is more in that vertical. And this is the one that if I decide to jump, Oh, hope I didn't lose my mic. You can imagine that these weighted otoconia, calcium carbonate crystals, they would kind of be left behind, which would then deflect the hair cells back. And this is the one you feel when you're on the elevator and you get to the very top of wherever you're going and it changes direction all of a sudden, it gives you that little woo feeling in the stomach. That's the otoconia being weighted and having a slight delay in the deflection of those hair cells. And so all this also goes down into the eighth afferent cranial nerve to the pons to create all kinds of fun responses in the brainstem level. 